welcome back. Oh, I have a question for you. Do you like a good murder mystery? <laughs> Our next guest wrote a murder mystery that you will not believe. Suppose we're in an all-white town and a mysterious African-American woman is killed. What happens? Who did it? Why? You're going to find out when you read his book. My name is Vinda Quino. Our next guest is Chris Kelsey. Chris, oh man, man. you got <laughs> one of those edge of the seat books. Talk to me. You're not only an author. You are, a ma uh, I was going to say a magician, <laughs> uh, but you are, but you're also a musician. You are a sax player from way back. You played in some of the great clubs in New York. Talk to me. Who is Chris Kelsey? <laughs> Chris Kelsey. Well, Chris Kelsey was born in Bangor, Maine in 1961. Bangor, Maine. Bangor, Maine. My, Lobster town. Uh, exactly. My mother and a father uh, met in Boston oh, when, when Boston. he was in the Navy and she was working uh, as a medical technician. Uh, we ended up, Oklahoma is my father's native state. We ended up moving back to Oklahoma when I was a little, very, very young, when I was an infant. So you're originally from Oklahoma. Yeah, I, I spent most of my, uh, my, most of my life in Oklahoma from wow. the time I was like two till uh, my mid-20s. Wow. I, uh, my father's a jazz musician. My mother was a librarian. I, wow. I, um, and just by coincidence, the main character of the book is a musician from Oklahoma. <laughs> it's totally unrelated to my Totally mind. unrelated, just coincidence. No. Well, he's, the difference being he's a, uh, his, his main uh, business is, being, is law enforcement. and he, oh, He's oh. an amateur musician. He never was good enough to, to actually be, be professional, even though he wanted to be one. But, um, yeah, so I got my love for literature from my mother and my love for music from my father. And the music dominated for most of my life. The, for most of the, I, so I, you started playing sex very young? About 10. I was about wow. 10 years old. And I started playing uh, uh, in school. And then I went to college and uh, started playing professionally around Oklahoma City in the, uh, in the early 80s. Wow. And uh, played jazz, rock, r rhythm and blues. Uh, got my degree in music education from the University of Central Oklahoma. Hmm. I, um, around 1986, uh, I moved to New York. I wanted to be a jazz musician. Moved to New York City. Lived there for about um, uh, 12, 13 years. And you played in some I, pretty well-known clubs. Right, right. I played uh, uh, the Knitting Factory, which at the time was the big, you know, a progressive jazz club in, yeah. in New York City. I played there many, 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 many times. Very, a lot of festivals in New York City. Um, when, when I did that till about 1998, when my uh, wife and I started a family, and then mm. we, uh, from there, we moved up state gradually until we ended up in Pauling. Yeah, in, in Dutchess County. Beautiful country. Up it is. Pauling. It is. Horse country. It is. It's a beautiful town. We love Pauling. And um, I, I, to back up a little bit, I started writing in the mid 90s when I was, um, uh, at the time, I was dissatisfied with the quality of uh, jazz criticism that I was seeing, especially there was a writer for the New York Times, which I, I so took So you predominantly issue. wrote about jazz? I wrote about jazz from uh, the early 90s till um, just a few years ago. Um, I, I wrote for major magazines and Jazz Times, Jazz Is, Cadence. Uh, I even wrote for Ms. Magazine for a time. Wow. Um, I wrote Nonfish. I wrote about music and jazz and the yeah. All Music Guide. In certain groups and certain musicians yeah. and yeah, I did pro profile artist profiles. Got to interview you know some very some great jazz musicians, wow. which was really, really uh, rewarding. I did that for uh, um, several years up till a few years ago. I kind of just got tired of it. I wasn't yeah. really. I it ceased being uh, very rewarding after a while. And I, uh, so I started teaching. I got a job at Trinity Pauling, mm. the school in, in Pauling, uh, teaching instrumental music, and that's where I still am. And um, wow, yeah, and I so it was and you're just still doing that. I'm still doing that. Wow. Yeah, so I start in a couple weeks, start school year. Yeah, a couple weeks. yeah. <laughs> summer's almost over, buddy. Uh, that's <laughs> <a lot. laughs> I know. I remember. Uh -huh. I taught for 35 years. Oh, there you go. You know, so, you know. and and 
the end of August was like Sunday nights, you know? <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's like, exactly. Oh, you get that little feeling in the yeah. pit of your stomach like, oh, shoot, tomorrow <laughs> I have to go back to work. <laughs> I, 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 try, I try to put it out of my mind, although I like my job, don't get me wrong. Yeah, but, oh, no, but, I hear you. But, I hear you. And it's also hard when you're a jazz musician mm -hmm. because, like, your free time is free time. Yeah, you know? that's true. And it gives you a chance to really enjoy your passion. Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of times our work is passionate, but not quite as passionate as our passions. Exactly. That's yeah. true. That's true. So do you still play? Yeah, I play. I mostly uh, do recordings now. I don't play oh. live too much. Uh, the the jazz, jazz business is, is uh, depressed considerably. And, uh, yeah the pay is not what I would like it to be. So I, I set a price for me, and when the price is met, I'll, I'll work. But uh, mostly I, I compose and record, rehearse and record my wow. own So do you, music. oh, you, your own music? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so do you play backup for, like, other musicians? Or? Not really. I mostly lead my own groups. Do your own? Yeah. So do you have, like, CDs and things? Oh, yeah, I've, got, I've done, like, 20 CDs, 20-plus wow. CDs over and the years. Wow. You can find them on, you, I, they're on Yeah, iTunes. so we can learn more about them on your website. Yeah, chriskelsey.com. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, so talk to me. When did you all of a sudden say, man, I'm right. Well, you didn't all of a sudden say I'm writing a murder mystery. You were into murder mysteries. Yeah. You liked reading them. Yeah. So I, who were your favorite people? Oh, the, the classics, Dashiell Hammett, um, yeah. Raymond Chandler, Ross um, No, you do know Ross that in one of the uh, shows that we did, I had a paranormal, a paranormal on here, and we found out that Dashiell Hammett actually really had space on her property in a cottage, and he wrote and lived in that cottage. That's amazing. And mm -hmm. she still believes that she has she saw spirits of him so he's local Dishel <laughs> Hammett's been around oh well I mean he I he was an influence on me and more contemporary writers like uh, Joe Nesbo um, wow. Philip Kerr who I'm reading his one of his he passed not too long ago but I'm reading one of his his next last book now yeah. um, and uh, in particular a couple of uh, uh, Swedish writers um, um, my Shule and and Per Valu, they're they're a, a husband wife team that wrote a series of novels back in the 60s and early 70s that dealt with uh, social issues in 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 Sweden, uh, murder mysteries that dealt with social issues, and that's kind of that kind of inspired me to do what what I did in this book, um, um, the way the way I approached it. Yeah, I've been a murder mystery guy for a little a boy came up to me one time when I was doing a talk on one of my books, and he said, Mr. Duquino. How do you write a exciting book if your life is boring? <laughs> and I said, don't write about what is. Write about what if. Yeah. Take real life situations and run with them. Mm -hmm. Now, when you wrote Where the Hurt Is, it isn't an autobiography. No. But... The main character is a jazz musician. Exactly. He does play sax. He does come from Oklahoma. Yes. But it isn't your story. It's his story. So tell me how you created a whole new story from the what if of your own life. Well, that's a good question. Um, well, number one, I... Um, I, I obviously I, I have never worked in law enforcement. My I have members of my family that have worked in law enforcement. So law, you've law borrowed a little bit of that family news. Brought yeah, it over here. And, and the kind of the kind of people they were. I mean, my members of my family that are, law, that are in law enforcement are very dedicated and and uh, very very admirable people. Mm -hmm. Very very um, moral people, and I admire them. I admire the kind of work they do, um, and I. Uh, used used that as a model for, for so him. So you used a little piece of this and a little, a little piece, piece of that. Of that and you created it. right, right, right. Uh, elements of, of various family members' personality mm -hmm. uh, and and who I would like to be. You know, who the yeah. kind of like uh, uh, Raymond Chandler wrote a a um, uh, an essay called the I believe it's called the Fine Art of Murder mm -hmm. that I read not too long ago, and uh, he he described 
the uh, the protagonist in in these detective novels is someone who who needs to be on someone beyond reproach ethically. You know, uh, um, someone you can count on to do the right thing no matter what, even right. if he fails, even if he falls. You know, short sometimes his his motivation is to do the right thing, and so that's the kind of character I was trying to come up with here. Someone you, you could count on to do to at least do everything he could to do the right thing. Right. And um, and I, I would you know if I were in many ways he's who I'd want to be um, if I were if I were yeah. a cop. In other ways, you know, he falls short. And I purposely set the book in 1965. Because that was a different time in this country, you know, as far as civil rights yeah. era. And, and it was a time you knew. Yeah, I grew up. So, there. you know, when I wrote Kiss the Candy Days Goodbye, uh, I, it's about a young boy, a 12-year-old boy with diabetes. Mm -hmm. I never had diabetes. Mm -hmm. My children never had diabetes. No members of my family ever had, well, not juvenile onset mm -hmm. diabetes. And I took three separate boys. And I took a little bit of each of the mm. three of them and created a new boy. Mm. Uh, and the story is fictitious, but many of the facts involved in there are not fictitious. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes when we write fiction, we have to do a little investigating of our own. Oh, definitely. So did you have to do some research to create this book? Oh, tons. Yeah, I, def I did tons of research. I, I, uh, you know, I was a little kid in 1965. I was four years old in 1965, so I don't have uh, vivid, vivid memories of, of, of adult things at that time. Yeah. The things adult, but yeah. but you know, I saw that I was watching the, the Vietnam War on television. You know, I saw the body bags. I saw what was going on. Yeah. I saw the pictures of you know Dr. King marching and and the you know the the riots and um, so I was aware of that stuff at a young age. And, but I had to, yeah, I had to go back and research it and, and get into the nitty gritty yeah. and the, the, the details. And, and your it. topic is kind of unusual. You, you're, you have this all-American white town, mm -hmm. and then you have a woman who is African-American mm -hmm. who was killed. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? Well, she showed up. She shows up out of nowhere, and and you know, there's no reason why she should be in this town because it's 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 all white. It has been all white for for decades. Um, there was a time in in the South where the, there were these things called sundown towns. You may be aware of where um, they were called sundown towns because if a black person found him or herself there after dark, he was in physical danger. He, wow. would, he or she would, you know, would get... And this is the could, 60s. Come. This was in the 60s, yeah. And, and towns where I actually lived, I found out in the researching of this book, were actually sundown towns. There where, um, um, when I lived in Edmond, Oklahoma, for instance, uh, I didn't have any African-American classmates. There were none, zero. The first African-American to go to school there that I was aware of came the year after I moved. Um, Edmond had been a sundown town. Norman, Oklahoma, where the University of Oklahoma is, had been a sundown town. I was unaware of this until I did the research for this book. So that plays into it. This town uh, is a sundown town, uh, Burr, Oklahoma, which is a fictional town in the book, is a sundown town of a sort in that, um, in that they, uh, the, the, there's a Klan presence. There had been a Klan presence, although by the mid-60s it had faded. Uh, they, the, what black residents had lived there had been run out of, uh, back in the the late 40s essentially um, so so essentially for like close to 20 years this town had been all white so when this young african-american woman is found on the train tracks outside the town with her throat cut you know this is like comes from out of nowhere and that's where the yeah. mystery that's what begins so I would imagine there's some racial statements here well yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and and it's the mentality the traditional sense of who they are and what they were is exposed in this novel. Well, one thing I, I you know, I, I've grown, grown up understanding and maybe intuitively or, or just from experience is that, that, you know, you can deal with, with people who are in many ways virulent racists on a daily basis. And they can be perfectly lovely people. They can treat you wonderful. They have to go out, they'll give you the shirt off their back. But they have these ugly, these ugly attitudes, yeah. and and that was um, 
when, when you're white and when you're living in one of these towns, you know, it, it you, everyone you don't, else believes it, so it's common. Well, well, it's common. I mean, it's just you don't not, th you don't not think necessarily about it. right, but common. You don't think about it. You yeah. know, it's just. But but you know, I, I I would grow up thinking, well, why aren't there any black people in this town, or <laughs> why you know why do I hear the N word literally? Someone say it almost every day of my life, and 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 you know, these people in many ways are great, wonderful people, but but they have these these prejudices, yeah. these yeah. this bigotry, this ugliness inside them. So so I tried to do that in the book. I tried to paint a picture of these people that's not that doesn't condemn them yeah. you know out of hand that tries to understand how they are where they came from yeah. and and where the feelings came from to, to a certain extent yeah, yeah yeah and 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 how it I don't know how successful I was but but how um, how, how it they don't they're dealing from a, a position of ignorance of, of not having the experience of relating to, to people of color and so you know they're just passing down feelings that they've inherited you right. know from 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 prior generations yeah. and it just it comes from a, a position and, of ignorance. you know I mean and, and there's a truth in that that sometimes we have to be awakened to the understanding yeah that things are not always right mm -hmm. uh, I'm writing yet another book on Sybil Ludington Mm -hmm. And the way women were treated was taken for granted. Right. You know, uh, a, a man does something, it's heroic. A woman does something, it's expected. You know? mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes we forget that while these men, while Colonel Ludington was out there fighting his battles and getting credit for being a hero, his wife was home with 12 kids, Whoa. you know, raising 12 kids and running the farm, Yeah, you know, and she got very little credit for that. Mm. And a soldier could go out in a battle and, or go out, not even be in a battle and be credited as a soldier. And he's a veteran. Right, right, for, right. And a woman does it and she was somebody who did a deed that day, yeah, you yeah. know? <laughs> uh, so yeah. it, 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 many years later, we have to look back and realize that things that are normal aren't. Mm. They aren't. And things that, in this town that were normal were not. Mm. So bringing that to light is a very important thing. So by the end of this book, uh, Man, where are we? Uh, well, I don't want you to give away the ending, but talk to me. <laughs> well, the the um, it, it, it's hard to describe without giving without away giving the away the ending. And, but, yeah. but but it, but uh, you know the the person the, the the guilty party is someone who who's you know brought up in, in that atmosphere and and is to a certain extent he, uh, this person is is. Um, Confused by it and conflicted by it, and he has these f certain feelings that 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 contradict that, and, and they contradict that way. But he doesn't understand them, and he feels like the feel his not. It's almost as if he feels his non-racist feelings are wrong, because he's been taught to feel to, to to believe that that the racial order of the time was the way things are supposed to be. Yeah. And so so he he this person. I, I slipped and said he, so I might as well keep saying. Yeah, but, 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 but but he he um, you know he he he's that's part of the part of the conflict besides the fact that he's a sociopath or maybe he's a psychopath. <laughs> but, but 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 part of the conflict is that that he doesn't really uh, he he can't reconcile the two attitudes the the way he feels on one side you know in a, in a positive vein and towards this woman and the way he he's been brought up to feel. About, right. about people like her, so, right. so I, I don't know if I, I, I don't really bring anything to a close. I don't really solve yeah. anyone's problems, but, but yeah. you know, I do. But with you that. bring it to the attention, yeah, and that's, that. that's okay. That's fine. All right, uh, for my audience out there of writers, and we do have an audience of writers, talk to me about the writing process. Do you get up in the middle of the night and write? Do you no. write at the kitchen table? Uh, do you write with a pad and paper? Tell me about you as a writer. Well, number one, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, writing is hard work. Yeah. I tell people, look, 
Your job isn't to write a piece. Your job is to work yeah. a piece. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get the idea and you got to beat the living hell out of it until it happens. It's and true. you make it work. It's hard. It's yeah. hard. And I, and I I've I've experiment I I think it was the Stephen King book on writing. I read many 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 years ago before I wrote fiction. And I think he, it was there where he talked about Hemingway wrote 800 words a day. Yeah. The next day he got up, edited what he did the day before, and then wrote another 800 words. Yeah. And I tried to do that for a long time. And through most of this book, that's kind of what I did. Um, at, but at the time when I was writing this book, I had, you know, it was open-ended. I didn't have any deadlines. I could yeah. write Did you have a sense of where the book was going? About halfway through, I, I didn't. A lot of writers write with a, an outline. I didn't. I yeah. started seat of the pants. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, and and I got about halfway through, and I thought, God, I better figure out how where this is going. Yeah. So I I, I came back and I kind of wrote in a kind of an outline synopsis kind of thing, decided where it was going, and then and then I carried on carried forth from that yeah. point. So, you don't have a set time of day that you write. You know, I should, but not really. I mean, I, I, I have to kick. Should. I have to kick myself in the bud to get myself to write because it's so daunting. Sometimes. Yes, it's yeah. so daunting. But once I get into it, yeah. like the then, I, then I'm in that world, and yeah, then that's it's right. and then getting like, to the world. Yeah, is hard. But once you get there, yeah, getting out of it, it's even harder. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I, I yesterday I spent eight hours at the computer. Wow, eight hours. I envy and that. the book is written. <laughs> the book is written. Mm -hmm. I'm already scheduled for publication by, like, hopefully January. And it, I read it again and again and <laughs> again and again. I work the piece. Yeah. And I just keep going and look for every... And do I make changes? Yes. The mm -hmm. book was done. I and know. I made at least 10 changes yesterday. Yeah, I do that all the and, time. And you say, well, they're minor. Yeah, but they changed the book. Right, right. They, you still went in there yeah. and made changes. Well, I haven't read this since it came out in print because I'm sure if I did, I'd want oh, to make oh, changes. Yeah. Oh, no. It I would go drive nuts. me crazy. I have a dozen books, and I don't think I've read. I mean, while I was writing them, I read them 100 times. Mm -hmm. After they were published, Maybe once, maybe twice. Yeah, you got to let you know, it go. Some of them I've never read mm -hmm. after the publishing date. Yeah. It's just in the same way. It makes you nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why did I write that? Why did I change that? Why didn't I catch that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. fortunately, fortunately, I, I, I was so intent on this being the book I wanted it to be yep. that I took, like I, I started to say before, I had an open-end schedule. I didn't have to have it to publish it at any part. It was my it first book. Yeah. So, so I just worked it and worked it and worked it and worked it and worked it, worked it, worked it <laughs> until, until I got it how I, I wanted. Then I goes to the publisher, and I worked it some more. I worked it, worked it, worked it. And yep. finally, you know, I, I got, I'm pretty happy with wh where, yeah. where I got. Where it got you know, it's, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, some authors will tell you that they will not send a book out until it's perfect from cover to cover. Mm. If I waited for that, I'd never. I'd be waiting up. for book one. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because uh, it's never so perfect. So you have to at least come to a point where you say, "Okay, I've done what I could do, and now it's ready." Mm -hmm. Like having a child. <laughs> you don't create the perfect child. No. You know, you have to work with the child yeah. as it goes along, and you have to pray that the child does all the right things and yeah. and manages to live longer than you yeah. and live well. True. And that's really the way it goes. So now that this book is done, next one? Well, this is the first of the series. Uh, I'm working on the second one. All right, so the uh, second one is in a series. Yeah, the second one is um, is called Butcherville. And it's, it's, it, it, it's the same town, same set of characters with new characters same added in. Uh, not not exactly. It's it's kind of it it, it shares with this uh, a, a rueful uh, uh, comic look at at some aspects of, of life in Oklahoma. You know, yeah. that, that because because they're you know like small towns have their have their they have their way. They have, have their personalities idiocy. like people. Yeah, and so this small town, I'm trying to develop a personality for it, and it's and I go and Butcherville is like same main character. Same, yeah. Emmett, uh, uh, Police Chief Emmett Hardy is his name, and um, yeah, same same protagonist. If and... you were to cast a modern day <laughs> actor, 
What would Emmett look like? Well, that's funny because, <laughs> you know, when I was writing this, I was thinking, actually, Tommy Lee Jones's voice. Oh, in, in, wow. In, Tommy in, Lee Jones would make a great but he's small too, town un- detective. Unfortunately, he's too old. So I, I, oh. Emmett's in his like late 30s, early 40s. And I was thinking the other day, someone, someone brought up um, um, uh, Billy Bob Thornton. Oh, and Billy. He'd be good. He'd be good. He's a little old, too, but he's about yeah, my age. Say, but he's okay. a little old, too, but... Great characters. I, yeah, I, I get it. I, I, could, I, could, I could deal with Billy Bob Thornton or Matthew McConaughey, maybe. Oh, man. <laughs> He's done some wicked, crazy roles. So. Also, a Timothy Oliphant, the guy from, um, what's that, that, that um, Justified. Do you ever oh, see that show? Yeah, That's I, a great I, I show. I think so, yeah. Yeah, he'd be, all, he'd be good. He'd be good. So, here's the big question, Mr. Kelsey. Final words to this audience. What are you going to tell them? Well, writing is hard. Writing is hard. Uh, and worth it. And it's worth it. And it's a journey it's worth that you it. need to take. Well, it's, yeah, if you felt, if you, if you have something to say, it's definitely worth the incredible time and effort that it takes. And it is to time do. and effort, and it's it sometimes time. aggravating, but it's so rewarding. I go to a place that no one has ever been. Yeah. And I read a book. That no one else has read yet. That's a good. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. And that, to me, is worth every ounce of the effort it takes to write. Yeah, I, I agree. I love going to this place. I, yep. I'm going to go, go back there go this to afternoon. A place. I mean, there were times when I sat down at the computer at five thirty after dinner, or or six thirty, and I finished at six thirty. A M. Oh yeah. And I literally went twelve hours straight. Wow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to tell you this, but this journey is coming to a quick end. I can't thank you enough, my friend. Thank keep you. writing, keep making music, keep doing what you do. Uh, enjoyed having you. When you finish the next book, come on back. I will. Good. <laughs> Look right, thank Love you. to have you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of One on One with Chris Kelsey.